Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. Just just opening the windows here, the glass doors. Thank you, Asha. No, don't don't put it on. Okay, so uh, we'll begin class today. We're going to look at um, Romans chapter three. We're going to study Romans chapter three. Uh, so before we begin class, can one of you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer. Prabhakar, would you lead, can you lead us in prayer, please? I'll pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Kenji. Heavenly okay, Father, Jehovah. Heavenly Father, Jehovah. I commit this class into your hands, and it's my prayer that whatever you are going to learn, things be of benefit to us as a family, to the group. We also pray for our teacher Selena. She proceeds there. I pray for God. Give her guidance. Give her the spirit, wisdom, and understanding as she teaches us. I pray believing in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Kennedy. Okay, so today we look at uh, uh, Romans chapter 3. Uh, can one of you please uh, read verses 1 through to verse 8? Anyone can read verses 1 to verse 8, please? Romans 3, 1, 8. Yes. What advantage is uh, what advantage then has, uh, has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Oh, what if did, sorry, what if some did not believe? What will their unbelief make uh, the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God un, uh, unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world. For if the truth of God has increased through my light to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slenderously reported and, and as some affirm what we say, their condemnation is just. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so in the first part of uh, this chapter, Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, uh, Paul is asking some questions and um, answering these questions himself, and this is in regard to uh, judgment. Now, in chapter 2, we see that Paul has already established the fact that uh, all will be judged according to the gospel. And now Paul addresses some uh, objections that would be raised against God's judgment, okay? Uh, about how God will judge. Uh, so he's uh, uh, asking some questions regarding this and he's answering it himself. And uh, hence we call these questions as rhetorical questions um, because he's asking the questions himself and he's answering it himself and hence we call such kinds of questions as rhetorical questions. Now his intent uh, in asking these questions is uh, basically to get people to think. Uh, his, uh, his intent also in asking these questions is to address uh, something that uh, they are asking 
uh, or they have been asking, and it's not an intent to get an answer from them, uh, because uh, you know Paul himself is going to answer uh, these questions that he is raising up, or uh, which he thinks you know, people have in their minds. So even as we study this chapter, you know we can just follow through what Paul's thinking. Uh, as he presents, uh, you know, his various logical arguments, his questions, his answers in chapter three, or we can follow uh, how he is unfolding uh, the truths of uh, God in his, um, uh, you know, even as he asks his questions and answers them uh, in chapter three. Now we need to remember that uh, the truth is basically coming from the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit is saying. Uh, what needs to be said or uh, the truths that need to be uh, communicated uh, to the church. Okay, so the Holy Spirit knows what truths or revelations need to be communicated to the church at Rome and he is communicating these truths, but it's basically being written uh, for us uh, by the Apostle Paul uh, in his own skill, in his own language, and in the context of uh, you know the from where he's coming from or his understanding or uh, his culture uh, so in this case paul is writing and so he's writing from his own skill his own language and the context uh, that he is coming uh, from so he's using his language uh, he's going to be using his words and his thoughts uh, but the truth that he's presenting here is from the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is saying, you know, I want these truths to be addressed to the church and we see Paul addressing these truths. So Paul is uh, a very logical thinker and uh, hence he's expressing these truths in a very logical manner for us. So he starts off by asking this question, which obviously uh, any Jew would ask. Um, you know, the Jew would be thinking or asking, okay, all this time we as Jews, we are thinking that we are the chosen people of God, you know, uh, you know, we have the laws, we have the covenants, we have the circumcision, uh, circumcision covenant, and through us all the nations of the world will be blessed. Okay, so that is what we've been thinking all this time. Uh, but now, Paul, you are saying that we are all sinners, uh, so are we of no use then? You know, are we of no use because we have been chosen uh, because God wants through us all the nations of the world uh, to be blessed. Uh, and now Paul, you're saying that we are all sinners, so are we of no use? Uh, so is it useless or is it unprofitable for us to be a Jew? Okay, so, uh, you know, Paul may be thinking, this must be a question that's running to the mind of a Jew. And so he's asking the question and he himself answers the question. So in verse 2, he says, uh, you know, he's answering. He says, of course not. You know, the Jew has an advantage uh, to them because what is the advantage? To them is committed the oracles of God. Okay. He's saying, you know, you Jews uh, or be Jews because he himself is a Jew. Paul is a Jew. So he's saying be Jews or you Jews are God's people because you have been committed with the word, you've been committed with the law, you've been committed with the commandments. Uh, so he's not saying that, you know, um, that they're totally discredited, uh, you know, and there's no importance of them being a Jew. Uh, yes, God has chosen them and through them he is going to reveal his laws, he's given the oracles uh, and uh, hence by Stating this, you know, Paul is answering his uh, first question. And uh, what is his first question? His first question is, what advantage then has uh, the Jew? Okay, or what is the profit of uh, circumcision? Circumcision. So he's saying, yes, there is an advantage uh, to us. Jews are committed the oracles of God, the commandments of God, the word of God, um, and you, as uh, people of God, have been committed. Uh, and you have been given the word of God. Okay, and hence you're totally, uh, you know, totally not discredited. Uh, there is some importance of you being a Jew. Uh, and we see later on in chapter 9, verses 4 to 5, Paul again, you know, highlights uh, the special place that Jews have uh, and the nation of Israel has 
uh, he says in chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, who are Israelites to him to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all eternally blessed God. Amen. So he's saying, yes, you know, all of us are sinners, uh, including you Jews, so you know, but you, but still you're not totally discredited. There is an importance of you being a Jew because you have been given the oracles, you have been given, uh, to you have been committed the word of God. And in verse, chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, he says, you have the glory, you have the covenant, the law, uh, you are the ones who are called to serve God, you are the ones who have been given the promises of God, and from, you know, you have the forefathers, and from, you know, from your race comes uh, uh, Jesus Christ, who is uh, overall eternally blessed, to whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So he asked the first question, and he answers it himself. Now the next question that um, uh, that most probably the audience or the people there would have asked, or would have you know, this question that run through their minds, is in verse uh, three, where it says, "For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without uh, effect?" Okay, um, so uh, you know, the question that Paul is saying here is. If uh, we don't believe, or if we Jews, Jews don't believe, does it affect all of this? Uh, you know, if we don't believe, it, will it change anything about God? Okay, and Paul goes on to uh, answer. He says, "Certainly not," which means no. Uh, it will not change anything about who God is. God will still continue to be faithful. And in verse 4 he says, let God be true in every man a liar. Okay, um, so Paul is saying somebody who believes uh, the word or somebody who uh, receives the word or somebody who does not believe or some does not receive the word is not going to change anything about God. Only it's going to be the same, it's going to be still the same God, he's still going to be faithful and he's still going to be uh, true. And then Paul goes on to quote a portion from David's prayer of repentance um, after he had sinned, uh, which we read in Psalm chapter 51, verse 4, where uh, the psalmist David, after his sin, says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you uh, judge. Okay, so Paul is quoting this uh, to reiterate. Uh, again, that our unbelief, you know, does not do away with the truth that we have sinned against God and that God is still just, he is blameless when he judges sin. So this is the second question and then he answers the second question as well. Now in verses 5 to 8, uh, he asks the third question and he answers it again. Uh, in verse 5 he says, but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? So, you know, some Jews might be thinking or asking this question that if their unrighteousness or their wrongdoing uh, is showing God as righteous, uh, you know, uh, uh, or is showing how righteous God is and is showing God as a righteous judge uh, because he's the one who's judging, then is God unjust? in inflicting wrath on us. So, you know, he's basically saying, is God being unjust by punishing us Jews because our wrongdoing is putting God in the good light, okay? Uh, uh, our, uh, you know, shortcomings, our wrongdoings is showing that he is a God who judges sin, uh, is showing that he is a judge, a just God, is showing that he is a righteous God is showing that, uh, you know, he's a God of truth and he judges uh, sin. So if our wrongdoing, uh, our misdeeds is putting God in good light, is portraying God in a good sense, uh, then, you know, why is God punishing us? Uh, or we can present this in another way, saying that if, you know, if we Jews tell a lie, uh, and we are judged because of that lie, and showing that God is, 
uh, true, uh, is, is actually making God look good and is actually showing that he's a God of truth. So then if our sin, our shortcomings, are uh, not keeping the law or following short of the law, if it's making God look good, to show that he's a God of truth, he's a God of righteousness, he's a righteous judge, then, you know, why are we being judged as sinners? Uh, because, you know, after all, uh, our life is making God look good, okay? Uh, now, just to give you an example, um, if you look at uh, you know, the life of, uh, if you look at the notes, it's given there about Judas Iscariot. You know, uh, if Judas Iscariot makes an argument like this, saying, you know, he goes to God and says, Lord, I know that I betrayed Jesus, or, you know, Father or God, I know I betrayed Jesus, but you used it for good. You know, in fact, if I hadn't betrayed Jesus, if I hadn't done this, then Jesus wouldn't have gone up the cross and people wouldn't have been saved. Uh, and what I even did, you know, my wrong deeds, what I even did is even fulfill scriptures. Then how can you judge me if all of what I have done is actually, you know, bringing about uh, you know the plan of God is fulfilling the God of uh, the uh, fulfilling God's plan and is even fulfilling uh, uh, the scriptures. Okay, so this is an argument that is here, and the Jews are saying that you know our unrighteousness is revealing the righteousness of God, and if our life is revealing the truthfulness of God, and the wrong that we are doing is showing God as good and how great God is. Then we, why are we judged for the wrong that we are doing? Okay, and Paul goes on to say that you know uh, in verse eight that some people are falsely accusing Paul that he's teaching them to do this. He's teaching people that and saying that let us do evil that good may come. Okay, now what is Paul's response to is this? So Paul's response to this is what he uh, says in verse six. Okay, in verse 6, he says, God does not want us to do evil. Uh, God does not want us to be unrighteous. God does not want us to yield to sin and to wickedness so that he can look good. Okay, God does not want us to speak lies so that uh, he can look uh, good as a God of truth. God does not want us to commit unrighteousness so that his righteousness will be shown. And that's why he says in verse 6, he says, certainly not. You know, God is not an unjust God. He is going to judge the world and he is going to judge our deeds. So having set the truth that, you know, our unrighteousness, our evil deeds, our speaking lies, is not going to, you know, uh, it's not so that God can look good. It's not so that he can show that he's a God of truth or uh, he's uh, a God of right, uh, righteousness. So, you know, uh, Paul says, certainly not. God is not an unjust God. He's going to judge the world. He's going to judge our deeds. Um, so, you know, what is God's response to what Judas would have said? You know, Judas, I just said what, uh, you know, Judas would have gone with his argument to God. But what would God have replied to Judas? God would have told Judas, yes, you know, God uses, uh, God used your wickedness uh, to bring about his plans and purposes uh, to fulfill what was said in scripture. But it was still your wickedness okay uh, there was no good there was no pure motive in what you did Judas there was no good or pure motive in your heart with what you did um, and it's not a credit to you that God brought about good out of the evil or the wickedness that you did you still stand guilty before God okay so God does not use our wickedness, our unrighteousness to show himself as good. He does not need to do that. He does not need to use that to show himself or to fulfill his plan of purpose or to fulfill what is written in scripture. And, uh, you know, God says, uh, tells Judas, no, you know. Uh, but in spite of that, God brought out something good out of your evil, but you still stand guilty before now, Judas stands guilty before God on three counts. One is in his deed, second his desire, third is his motive. Okay, Judas did sin before God. His deed was an act of betrayal of a friend or a master or his teacher. The second thing is his desire. His desire was for the 30 pieces of 
silver. And the third thing is his motive. His motive was to please the chief priest rather than to stay faithful to his master and uh, who trained him for the last three years. Okay. So even though God brings out something good out of our wrong, as we see in Judas's case, God's purpose was still carried out, yet he judges Jude, uh, Judas's sins. And, you know, God will judge each one of us on these three things, our deeds, our desires, and our motives. Okay. Now, Apostle Paul does not take time to, uh, uh, you know, uh, he answers this question that would be running across in the, Jew, uh, the mind of the Jews or, you know, they would have even asked this question. He answers it. But you we see here that Paul does not take time to respond to the slander and the false report about him. He simply states, okay, he simply states, I think in verse, um, uh, he simply states in verse, um, in verse 8 that their condemnation is uh, just, which means he essentially leaves it to God to handle such people knowing that God will judge righteously. And uh, this is something, you know, we can learn. This is a lesson that each one of us learn, even as people, you know, we, how to deal with people who slander us, who speak evil of us, who falsely accuse our ministry. Uh, you know, Paul does not uh, respond to them, to their slander or false report. He simply states their condemnation is just. That means he just lets God deal with them. So you and I also, you know, we just basically let God deal uh, with uh, them. Okay, those who condemn us, those who slander us, those who spread a false report against us or our ministry. Okay, so that is uh, the questions that he answers uh, in verses one to verse eight. Okay, verses one to verse eight, he answers these uh, three questions and he uh, asks these three questions and he answers it himself. Now we'll look at uh, verses 9 to 20. Uh, anyone has any questions about verses 1 to verse 8? Any questions about uh, from verses 1 to verse 8? I hope you're like, able to understand and follow through. Yes, Pastor, yes, but I have one question. Um, can you please explain uh, the difference between motive and desire? Clarify a little bit. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, so you want me to explain uh, uh, motive and uh, uh, desire. Okay, so here we see in uh, Judas's case that uh, you know uh, his desire was you know for money. Okay, his desire was for money. So sometimes a desire can be for a position, for a fame, for a you know, a high placing for people to speak well of us, uh, you know, uh, to make more money, uh, to climb up, uh, you know, uh, the ladder of success. But our motives, why we're doing what we are doing, uh, will also be judged. Is our motive to be in a leadership position in the kingdom of God? Is it because we want to, uh, you know, uh, enhance uh, the gift of God that has been given to us and, and hence fulfill uh, the calling or the office that God has called us to, the office of leadership, because we have the gifts uh, to fulfill that calling, to fulfill that uh, uh, office, to fulfill that function. Uh, uh, and uh, is our motive uh, to use our leadership gifting and our function uh, to further the kingdom of God, or is it our motive uh, for us, for uh, you know, uh, for our hidden desires, like for fame, to make more money, um, uh, to be spoken of well, to be famous in the city, or uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever, you know, to uh, to get promotion, whatever. So, uh, what is our motive? Okay, our motive is for for uh, Jude, uh, Judas. His motive was, 
you know, he wanted to please the chief priest rather than being faithful to his master. So is your motive to come into leadership position? Is it to, you know, further God's kingdom, uh, to fulfill God's calling in your life, the office, the function that he's called you to leadership, to build his kingdom, uh, to stay committed to your uh, master, to stay faithful to him? Or is your motive uh, of leadership to, you know, or fulfill your desire, your passion of making more money or fame or uh, position or status in life? So did that uh, help, Mangi? Uh, yes, 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 ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so anyone has any other questions? Thank you for that question, Mangi. Anyone has any questions? There's no questions. Can we move on? Okay, we look at verses 9 to 20. Can somebody read verses 9 to 20, please? Anyone? Verse 9 to 20. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seek after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, no one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of us, us, us is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says that those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deed of the, of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the is the for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Thank you, Maggie. So uh, here Paul moves on to the next point. He has another question, and uh, it says, "What then are they better than they? That means, are the Jews better than the Gentiles?" Okay, and Paul says, "No, not at all." What, why? Uh, 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 you know why is uh, uh, why can't we say that the Jews are better than the Gentiles because or the Gentiles are better than the Jews? He says because both Jews and Gentiles have sinned. You know both are under sin, and uh, yes, Jews have a special place in God's uh, sight. You know they have been given the law; they are custodians of the law. To them have been entrusted the law, but they are all under sin. All have sinned. Okay, and then he quotes uh, the Old Testament scripture here in Romans 3, verses 10 to 12. He's quoting from Psalm 14, verses 1 to 3, and Psalm 53, verses 1 to 3, where he says that no one is righteous, okay, no one is seeking after God. Uh, and by quoting the Psalms, he's saying that people are speaking evil, they are practicing evil, they're going after destruction. And there is no one who fears God. Okay? And he's saying whether we are talking about Jews or Gentiles, all of us are like this. Okay, There is no one righteous. We are all sinful in what we think, say, and do. You know, we are all speaking evil. We are all practicing evil. Uh, there's no fear of God. There's no one who's seeking God. And there's no one uh, righteous. We are all sinful in what we think, say, and do. And verses 19 to 20, he says, so if you have the law, you know, you will be judged by the law. He's telling the Jews. Okay. But he says, ultimately, all the world stands guilty before God. Okay. And he tells the Jews, by the deeds of the law, you can never be 
justify. Don't think that, you know, by keeping the law, uh, you know, or being custodians of the law, because you have the law, the law can justify you. No, it cannot justify you. Why? Because what is the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is basically to expose sin, to show a person when they have fallen short of God's standard, when they have fallen short of what God requires of them, when they are not doing what they are supposed to do. The purpose of the law is actually it shows that we are sinful. So don't think that the law that because you have the law, you can be justified by the law. No, because the law just exposes sin. It shows that we are sinful when we break the law, we fall short of the law, we don't keep the law, we don't do the law. So through all that Paul has written so far, now he starts to present the solution. Okay, what has he already uh, established or what has he written that we are all sinners? Uh, you know, whether we have the law, whether we have the conscience, whether we have the reason, you know, we are all sinful, we have fallen short of God's glory, we've fallen short of God's standard, we've all broken the law, and hence we all stand guilty before God. Now, what is the solution? We're all sin, we've all fallen short of, the God's, of God's law, His standard, what is the solution? Okay, and he says, God Himself is bringing the solution. Now God himself is giving the solution. Now this is God's solution. And in giving the solution, uh, Paul is, you know, maintaining something. He's maintaining that God is being righteous. Okay, He's saying that God is providing a solution for us in our predicament. Okay, God is giving us a solution. Um, and what is that solution? He's saying that, you know, uh, uh, God is being righteous. He's bringing about his righteousness. He's bringing about his righteousness when he judges sin, okay? And he is also bringing about his righteousness when he paid the price for sin and he makes the sinner righteous in, your, in his sight, okay? And uh, he's saying, you know, uh, he's providing a solution for our predicament. Uh, the predicament is, you know, uh, you know, we are unrighteous, we are sinful people, but in our unrighteousness, in our sinful, in our sinfulness, you know, God's righteousness is uh, being revealed. So if God's righteousness is being revealed in our sinfulness, if God is being shown as true, if God is being shown as good, then can we continue doing evil? Okay? And so Paul is answering that question and he's saying, you know, God himself is bringing the solution for our uh, predicament. And then he presents this in verses 21 to 26. Okay? So can somebody please read 21 to Verse 26, please. Anyone read verse 21 to 26? Okay, verse 21 to 26. But now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. Being witnessed by the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because of his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Thank you, Maggie. So in these verses, in verses, uh, uh, 21 to 26, you know, Paul is talking about the righteousness of God. Uh, to be righteous means to be blameless or to be just. To be righteous means to be blameless or to be just. just. 
So the faultlessness of God or the blamelessness of God is the righteousness of God. So when we say God is righteous, means that he is faultless, he does not commit any faults, mistakes, sins, he is blameless, we cannot find any sin in him. The faultlessness or the blamelessness of God is the righteousness of God, and no one can find fault with God. But when we say that we have been made righteous before God, it means that we've been brought to this position where we are uh, blameless and we are faultless in the eyes of God, or we are being, or we are blameless and faultless uh, before God or before uh, His eyes. So the righteousness of God does not come, Paul says, the righteousness of law, God does not come through the law. It does not come by maintaining the law, keeping the law. Okay, the righteousness of God does not come through the law. The ability uh, to be blameless and faultless before God uh, does not come uh, from the law. Okay, and he says it comes through Jesus Christ and uh, his righteousness. And uh, he says this was already spoken of by the prophets. It was foretold that God would do this. Okay, so in verse 22, Paul is saying that the whole world is guilty before God. Uh, no one can be justified before God because no one can be righteous in God's eyes. Uh, but there is a righteousness that God is giving to everyone without partiality, both to the Jews and to the Gentiles, both to the Jews and to the Greeks, to everyone. And this is God's own righteousness which he's giving. Okay, and this righteousness, he says, is coming from God, and it's the righteousness that is given to giving that has been given to all believers and to all who have faith in Jesus Christ. So he says it's not by keeping the law, it's the, not the law that justifies, it's not the law that makes us righteous. Now the words righteous, right, just, uh, uh, just justify, righteousness, justification, you know, all comes from the same uh, 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 root word from Greek, which basically means, you know, to be right before God, okay, or right standing before God. Okay, so we can use this, um, uh, you know, one for another, uh, we can just use it uh, because all of them have the same meaning. So what Paul is saying here is that, you know, uh, uh, that the righteousness that God is giving, He's giving it to everybody, He's giving it without partiality, both to the Jews and the Gentiles, to everyone. And this righteousness is the that is God's own righteousness. It's coming from God and it's uh, given to all believers and to all who have faith in Jesus Christ. So He says, How is uh, God's righteousness made available to us? He says, It is through faith in Jesus. Christ. Okay, so the righteousness of God means a righteousness that comes from God, something that is God given, a righteousness belonging to God, something that is of Himself and not of something that is inferior or of secondary quality. And, uh, you know, it's given to everyone uh, without partiality, both to the Jews and the Gentiles, the Greeks, um, and to all those who have faith in Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about the most famous verse, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He says, we have all sinned and missed the mark of the glory of God. You know, man was originally created to carry out and display the glory of God, but sin has robbed us of this. And in verse 24, he goes on to say, but this righteousness is, you know, given to us freely by his grace. And this righteousness is through redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Now this word redemption uh, in the, you know, was very, uh, a very familiar word, a concept in, in the minds of the Jews. Uh, the word redemption for the Jews, uh, they understood it as, as some, buying something back by paying a price. So you buy something back by paying a price. It had an idea of buying a slave out of a slave market. Uh, it had also an idea of paying a ransom uh, to get somebody's freedom. Uh, and it had this idea of buying some 
you know, something back with the price and restoring it back to its original state of freedom. So this whole word redemption, you know, was a very familiar word in the, in the minds of the Jews. They knew it was buying something back with the price, uh, buying something out of, uh, buying a slave out of a slave market. Uh, the idea of paying a ransom to get somebody's freedom and it's basically buying something to, you know, uh, with a price and restoring that uh, person or that thing to its original state of freedom. Okay, so the righteousness of God here we see is given to all, to those who believe, to those who have faith in Jesus Christ. It's given freely by His grace, and uh, uh, and God is giving us this righteousness on the basis of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, which means Jesus on the cross, he paid the price uh, to buy us back to himself. We originally belonged to God, you know, but when Adam and Eve sinned, they, you know, uh, you know, became uh, slaves of Satan. They came under his authority. They gave their authority and dominion, which God had given to them, they gave it uh, to Satan. And so when God redeemed us, he, you know, brought us back uh, with the price. He gave his very life. He shed his blood. He gave his life. And that's the price that he paid. And he brought us out of slavery, out of darkness, into his marvelous light, uh, to being sons of God, to being heirs of God, to being co-heirs uh, with Christ in his kingdom. And he also paid the price and uh, so that we could be, uh, you know, uh, restored back to our original state. And what is our original state of how God created us to be? How God created us to be, created us to reveal his glory, okay? To have, to, he created us to reveal his glory, to reveal who he is and what he does. He also created us to, uh, you know, uh, have uh, subdue the world, subdue the forces of darkness, and to have authority and uh, dominion on this world, and uh, to you know further His kingdom here on earth. So we have been, you know, uh, to God to the redemption that Jesus Christ brought about. We have been restored back to our original state that God created us to be. So in verse twenty-five, uh, Paul says about Jesus, he says, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. Okay, now this word propitiation in the Greek, when it's translated, is uh, it, it means the mercy seat. Okay, but in English, when uh, we, we translated in English, the word propitiation is used, uh, uh, and it's used with an attempt to capture uh, the Greek translation, uh, which is an attempt to capture, uh, you know, what happens at the mercy seat. Now, Paul is saying God has sent Jesus Christ as our mercy seat. Now, why is he using this word propitiation, propitiation by his blood? Um, you know, why is he using all these words? Because these words were very familiar for, or this concept was very familiar for the Jews. They were very familiar with the mercy seat of God. Okay, now the mercy seat of God is basically, uh, you know, a very familiar concept for the Jews. They knew about it in the tabernacle. You know, we have the outer court, the inner court, we have the uh, holy place, and we have the holy of so the outer court was for the Gentiles, the inner court um, and uh, was where all the sacrifices were made in the holy place where all the incense and everything was burnt, uh, you know, and the holy of holies was the place where the table, uh, sorry, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Now the Ark of the Covenant was a box which was, you know, uh, which was laid over by gold. And in it was um, in the in the Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's uh, rod and the Ten Commandments, and uh, the, on the lid of that uh, box, you know, was um, uh, two uh, angels with their uh, you know with their wings covered, and in between was the mercy seat. 
and uh, every year when the high priest would enter the holy of holies you know he would take the blood of the animal that was sacrificed that was made for the atonement of the sins of the entire uh, israelite uh, people he would take that blood and he would go and sprinkle it on that mercy seat and god says you know when you do that i will meet with you there when when the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the atonement that was made god said it is there you know between that two angels with their wings covered in between that is the mercy seat you know as god says i will have mercy upon you because your you know your sins have been atoned for and because your sins have been atoned for the blood has been sprinkled of the animal that was sacrificed i will meet with you i will speak with you so it was a sign of man being reconciled to god it's a sign of man being righteous before god it's a sign of man being able to stand before god and meeting this holy awesome powerful god and god speaking with man so propitiation is basically you know to capture the atonement at the mercy seat where man was being made righteous with god man was being able to meet with god and speak with god okay so paul is saying that jesus has become our mercy seat jesus has become the place where the atonement was made and because of christ's atonement on the cross and the blood that he shed for us you know we have been reconciled with god you know we are able to stand before god uh, as blameless and faultless and righteous before his presence before his eyes now you know uh, we have been reconciled with god means that the righteousness of god has been imputed upon us which means that the righteousness of god uh, so to say has been put into our account okay so it's not our righteousness but it's god's righteousness christ's righteousness that has been put into our account and because of which we have been made righteous we have a right standing with god we stand before god and uh, you know uh, we are seen as faultless and blameless before uh, god so verse 25 he paul is saying this whole thing demonstrates god's righteousness that god himself is righteous in doing this uh, in the past, Paul is saying here in verse 25, in the past, God overlooked sin, which means that he did not pour out all his judgment upon sin right there and then, but he reserved, you know, the judgment for sin to be poured out on Jesus at the cross when he died for our sins. And by so doing, you know, God has been righteous. Okay. Verse 26, he says, um, he is righteous because sin has been judged on the cross. Uh, and not only that he is righteous because sin has been judged on the cross, he is also righteous because he is justifying those who have faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, God is righteous not because he's, uh, you know, he's judged sin on the cross, but he's also the justifier of those who have faith in Christ jesus which means god is saying i have judged sin hence i'm a righteous god but i'm also able to justify those who have sinned uh, because their sins have been judged in the redemption that is in christ that means the price that jesus christ uh, made on the cross by giving his own life he is also able to justify those who have been who have sinned that means he's also able to make those uh, who have sinned righteous as uh, being presented as righteous and blameless and faultless before god so what paul is basically saying is that god can be both the judge the one who condemns sin and the one who forgives sin because of the cross because christ has become our mercy and because the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So God is both the righteous uh, or the just, and He's also the justifier, means that God is just in judging sin and acquitting the sinner and is able to do this because of the cross. Now, having said this, you know, Paul uh, comes to make his conclusion um, uh, and uh, he's going on to tell us in verses 27 to 31 
what we really uh, need to know, what God really wants to reveal to us, or what he really wants us to know. So that we look uh, in the next class on Wednesday, verses 27 to 31. So I hope you've been able to understand what's the meaning of propitiation, uh, atonement, and how we have been made righteous, blameless, how we are justified in God's sight. It's because of the righteousness of God, because uh, what he did on the cross, that we are, uh, you know, have a right standing with God. We are able to come before God's presence, uh, and God is able to meet man and speak with man, just as you know He originally did in the Garden of Eden. Okay, so that is Romans chapter three, uh, verses one to verse twenty-six. Anyone has any questions? No questions. I think by the time we've come to third year, all of you have quieted down quite a bit. Otherwise, <laughs> I remember in our first year, we just wouldn't be able to complete our portion. We would have so many questions, so many people saying things, so many people, you know, showing us references and helping in the, you know, contributing in the class. But all of you now have become very quiet, quieting down quite a bit. <laughs> So I don't know if that's good or bad, but I was hoping that, you know, I thought about third year's Romans, you know, better prepare well because we have all of them going bang, 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 bang. <laughs> okay. So no one has anything to say. I hope all of you are in the class with me. All of you are following, are able to understand. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> More serious and committed. <laughs> Thank you, Rose. Okay. Okay, Christopher says questions. Can I say something, Pastor? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, everyone. For uh, yes, uh, Charles. Um, as as our our, our first student said that we are serious. You know, the book of Romans is is a strong book, so. It is working. I don't know how to say it, but it's like we are on a surgery. So we we are doing. God is doing a surgery on us. We are saved. But sorry, we can't hear you, Charles. Sorry, Charles. I think do you hear him, uh, Kung Asha? No? Uh, sorry, we couldn't hear you, maybe your, because of your internet connection. Hello, Charles. I can't hear you. Well. Sorry, Charles, we couldn't uh, hear you. Or maybe <laughs> next class when, you, uh, when your internet connection is good, Maybe you can uh, share with us what you had to say. Uh, yes, Kennedy? You had your hand up. I, I, I would request Charles to repeat what you said because it has touched me. <laughs> and what is he saying? OK, repeat it. Maybe uh, he can repeat it uh, uh, next class when his uh, connection is better. OK, uh, thank you all for joining class. Um, and uh, I'll see you all on uh, Wednesday. Have a good weekend. God bless you all. Have a refreshing weekend and see you all next Wednesday.